Well, thank you so much. And just before I read from Scripture, I just want to say thank you for the amazing welcome that I and my family have received since we've come here to Ventura. It is a beautiful, beautiful place. And I also bring greetings from King Charles III uh, to his loyal citizens and subjects here in the West Coast of America. We had a little falling out, I know, uh, a couple of hundred years ago. But anyway... um, It's great to be with you. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to sharing a message, which, as I say, I hope will encourage you this morning. We're going to start, though, in Scripture. And um, I'm going with Acts 17. It's a well-known passage where Paul, the apostle, is, is on a journey through the Mediterranean with some traveling companions, spreading the good news of Jesus. He's just been run out of two towns before he finds himself with an unexpected layover in Athens. And Athens, you've got to imagine, is kind of the intellectual capital of the ancient world. Anyone who's got ideas to share, thoughts to think, they go to Athens to do it. But Paul isn't very pleased when he pitches up in Athens. It's because he's a God-fearing Jew. And we're going to read from Acts 17, verses 16 to 23. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day, with those who happened to be there. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting at the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you are presenting? You're bringing some strange ideas to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. All the Athenians and the foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about and listening to the latest ideas. Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. For as I walked around and looked carefully at your objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. So you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. And this is what I am going to proclaim to you. Let's pray. Father God, may you open up your word to us by your Holy Spirit this morning. And as we read these ancient words, may they speak fresh truth and life into our hearts. And may the words I speak and the thoughts of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. So as Tim said, I've spent quite a lot of my life hosting conversations between Christians and atheists. About 17, 18 years ago, I began a radio show and podcast in the UK called Unbelievable. And it's a podcast where I sat down with Christian thinkers and atheists to talk about whether we can make sense of faith, whether it makes sense to believe, about history, about science, about ethics. And it was a wonderful show that I was so glad to host and meet so many people on both sides of the aisle And at the center of it really was 1 Peter 3.15. If you know that scripture, it says, always be ready to give an answer to anyone who asks you about the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. And I was trying to create a gentle, respectful atmosphere in which we could have good faith conversations. And it was wonderful to see the way the show blossomed and the way that it started to be listened to all over the world. A lot of listeners here in the U.S., I only moved on from hosting those conversations between atheists and Christians about a year or two ago. And since then, I've been engaged in a new project, really looking at all of those conversations and bringing them together in a book and a new podcast series called The Surprising Rebirth of Belief in God. As Tim mentioned, it's really encapsulated in the subtitle, which is Why New Atheism Grew Old and Why Secular Thinkers Are Considering Christianity Again. I'm encouraged, I'm convinced that actually there's a new conversation on God happening in our culture. I'll be sharing more about that this evening at 6 p.m. and we'll be taking some questions as well. But I'd like to kind of just today 
Look at the way in which Paul in Athens really models for us how to engage the questions of our culture today. And the fact that God is working in all kinds of surprising ways. Very often we feel kind of beat up and let down by the way that Christianity is perceived in the culture. We can feel like, hey, is Christianity really viable for the future? I would say yes, it is, because God has a habit of surprising us in every generation with something new. My faith really came out of the fact that my parents were Christians and I was raised in a Christian home. Obviously, I had to make that faith my own, and I did that in my teen years. But in many ways, my parents' faith was actually birthed in the sort of late 60s, early 70s, at a time that was often known as the Jesus People Revolution. They were kind of ex-hippies in the UK who suddenly found faith in this very radical way. I was born into a kind of Jesus community. They actually lived together, had all things in common. It was quite a radical lifestyle. And that was, those were the early years of my life and where they found their faith. But the Jesus People Revolution, in a funny way, ties me right here to California and the West Coast because it was right here on the shorelines of California that thousands of young people, hippies from the counterculture, came and experienced new life, rebirth, coming out of the drugs and rock and roll scene and suddenly finding the Holy Spirit and kind of turning their instruments and their music towards God. Uh, this took place along a lot of the beaches where people were baptized. There's a picture here of um, Pirate's Cove, many thousands of young people in the late 60s and early 70s coming to be baptized during this time that, that actually Time magazine featured on its front cover in 1971, and they, they gave it the name The Jesus Revolution. Time magazine sort of did a special cover edition of this extraordinary phenomenon as thousands of young people started to come and give their life to Christ, coming out of this hippie counterculture. What's interesting about that Time article is that just five years previously, the front cover of Time magazine had been this iconic black cover with three red words on the front, is God dead? That was their prediction in 1966. Just five years later, they were talking about this extraordinary revival going on on the west coast of America. It's amazing what can happen in a short amount of time. By some estimates, over a quarter of a million people were converted during the West Coast Jesus Revolution. And it spread far and wide, as I say. My parents kind of were swept up in the kind of the UK version of the Jesus People Revolution. And in, in many ways, I, I owe my own faith to that movement. But as we stand here now, or sit here now, it's been more than 50 years since that movement happened. And it's had a great amount of fruit, lots of ripples that have gone all over the world. But in many ways, those, those hippies who came out of the culture and became Christians, they went on to have their kids who became the Gen X and millennials. And they've gone on to have the Gen Z generation. And with each progressive generation, it could be argued that faith has diminished. That faith has started to grow thin. More and more people are describing our age as a post-Christian age, a secular age, an age where we're seeing the rise of the nuns, the N-O-N-E-S, the, the people who say they have no religious affiliation. And you probably know a lot of them in your life. So the question for me is, well, which cover of Time magazine got it right? The 1966 one, prophesying that maybe God is dead, or the Jesus Revolution of 1971? Well, I'm going to go with the Jesus Revolution because I think what you saw in the Jesus Revolution is happening again in a different way today. And that actually God surprises every generation with something fresh, something new. And I want to go into this story of Athens and Paul in Athens in Greece, speaking to the thinkers of his day to show that actually God is doing something new in every generation. And he did a new thing in Paul's generation even if you weren't around in the heyday of the Jesus People Revolution of the 60s and 70s, you might have seen something about it. Just last year, there was a, a film that came out called Jesus Revolution. And um, it was very popular. In fact, we even had screenings in the UK that I took some of my house group to. What they did there was they took a big movement and they put it into a, a really helpful story. And this was the, the story of Chuck Smith, who, who founded the Calvary Chapel Network. 
and his unlikely friendship with hippie evangelist Lonnie Frisbee and the way that together they saw this incredible move of God, thousands of young people coming to Christ. I think it's really helpful sometimes, isn't it, to have a story that we can grab onto. We sometimes talk in big picture ideas and concepts, but very often it's a story that helps us to understand it. I think that's why we love the movies. We love to hear stories. And those stories reflect our own feelings, don't they? Uh, our, Our desire for justice, for beauty, for truth, for love. Those are the stories that we turn up to, you know, the 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 superhero stories, the Harry Potter stories of good versus evil. These are the blockbuster films. And I think it's because we're fundamentally storytelling creatures. We're driven by story. There's a a thinker called Jonathan Gottschall, and he's written a whole book about the way we're kind of made to be storytelling creatures. And he says this, we as a species are addicted to story. Story. We need a story to make sense of our life. He says, if we don't have a story, if we feel like we're just bouncing around chaotically in life, it leads to all kinds of problems. We we, we feel like we don't have any purpose, any meaning, any identity. I think that's the way a lot of people feel in our culture today. Because we did have a story that made sense of our culture, the Christian story. But today, I think people are reaching for all kinds of other stories. As we've seen the Christian story recede into the background, I think people are reaching for all kinds of other stories to try to make sense of their life. The problem is, those stories aren't enough. And as Paul shows us in this story from Acts, actually, everyone's seeking, everyone's looking for a story to make sense of their life, but there's only one story that will ultimately make sense of their life. And we are being called to tell our story afresh to a culture that is desperate, desperate to hear it, actually. Whether it seems like it or not, actually, they're desperate to hear the story that underlies all other stories. So let's turn to this passage from Acts. Now, as I say, remember, the thing to bear in mind is that Paul is a devout Jew. Idol worship to a Jewish devout Jewish person was an anathema. It was the worst thing you could do. It was an absolute desecration of how God should be treated. So you can understand why he's so upset. I mean, the the English translation doesn't really do it justice. It says, while Paul was waiting for them in Athens, he was deeply distressed to see that the city was full of idols. I mean, that's like a, it's actually like a heart-wrenching anguish that it's talking about. He sees these people that they're being blinded by these idols. They're going in the wrong direction. But it's so interesting, isn't it, that when he receives this invitation to come and talk about his beliefs, his ideas, he doesn't doesn't berate them, he doesn't dismiss them, he engages them. Now, the Areopagus and the thinkers who were gathering there to, to discuss all these ideas, I love the way it puts it in the text. Now, all the Athenians and the foreigners living there would spend their time in nothing but telling or hearing something new. I mean, that kind of sums up my social media timeline, basically. You know, people who want to discuss or hear something new. We, we, still, we basically live in the same culture. And we may not think that, you know, today we have many idols in our lives, but actually I think we've just got just as many idols as they had in Athens. We just call them by different names. You know, they exist in the shopping mall rather than the temple of the goddess Athena, which overlooked the Areopagus where they were having this conversation. So let's see what Paul says to them when he's invited to talk about his ideas. From the text, it says here, Then Paul stood in front of the Areopagus and said, Athenians, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship as unknown, this I proclaim to you. I just love Paul's approach here, don't you? Because he is personally offended by these idols. He's distressed, but rather than berate them, he engages them. And he does it this way. He says, I can see that you're looking for something. He says, I see how extremely religious you are in every way. And then he goes on to explain why the God that they've been searching for, groping around for, is closer than they realized. Now, you may say to me, well, what has this got to do 
with Ventura in 2024, Justin. That was 2,000 years ago. Yes, people believed in idols. People were religious back then. People aren't religious anymore. I would say no, people are just as religious today as they were back then. We're just religious about different things. I mean, one way of thinking about this is the fact that when I've been around California and the coast here, I've, I've often seen in businesses uh, and, and shop doorways and even on people's front lawns, signs, okay, signs that you will probably recognize. I'm going to give an example here on the screen. It's a sign like this. It says, in this house, we believe, and then there's a set of statements, Black Lives Matter, women's rights are human rights, no human is illegal, science is real, love is love, kindness is everything. Now, what is this lawn sign? I would say that the, what this lawn sign is, it's a modern creed. You know what a creed is? It's a statement of religious beliefs. We have well-known creeds in the Christian faith. I believe in God the Father, Jesus the Son, the Holy Spirit. We, we kind of set up our doctrines, our, our fundamental core beliefs in a set of statements that we can, if you like, understand and learn and, and affirm together. This is no different. This is, if you like, a modern secular creed. We're not non-religious today. Now, the person who has this on their front lawn, they may not think of themselves as being religious, but actually they are, because fundamentally these ideas are actually tied back to Scripture. Tonight I'm going to be talking about uh, an interesting secular historian, Tom Holland, um, not the Spider-Man actor, a different Tom Holland, but he, he's talked about the way in which lots of these kind of what we often think of as, as secular statements about right and wrong, value, goodness, they actually come ultimately from the Christian story, a Christian story which made us believe in love and dignity, equality. Now, whether or not you agree with the kind of political side of what's, what's being displayed here, what you can't deny is that there's still a fundamentally religious aspect to us. And I think the reason for that is because, as I said, we're story-driven creatures. We need a story to make sense of our life. And, and even if we lose the Christian story, we'll replace it with another story. You see, the Christian story, which informed the, the kind of the ethos and the, the ideas of generations of people, said this. It said, there is a God and you are made in God's image. That gives you infinite value and worth. And life is tough. The world is fallen, but God came in person to do something about it, to live the life that you and I live, to die and be raised again, to give us a hope and a future in which we can live this new life in God. That story has informed generations of our forebears. But as we've lost that story that gave us meaning and purpose and identity, the question is, what replaces it? Because we still need a story to live by. And if people start to forget that story, they're still going to grab onto another story. And today, people are grabbing onto all kinds of other stories in our culture. Quasi-religious stories. The stories that make people put yard signs out on their lawn. It might be a story about sexuality and gender on the progressive left that says, yes, this is the sacred thing. This is what I'm going to make my life about. It might be a story on the right. It might be a kind of political mythology. Only having faith in this person will put us back on the right track. The point is, wherever you are on those kind of political spectrum, they're all stories that we're trying to make sense of life with, but none of them are the true story. These are all sub-stories. There's, there's an actual story that we're looking for all along, and none of those other stories are going to do the job for us. There's a, there's a famous thinker, 17th century mathematician, Blaise Pascal, and the way he put it was that um, there's a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each person which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God, the creator, made known through Jesus Christ. It's this, it's this God-shaped hole. And very often the idols in our culture are the things that we're trying to fill the God-shaped hole with. It could be career, it could be money, it could be relationships. Those are kind of often the things that we use to try and fill the God-shaped hole. But there's all kinds of other stories that we're using to try and make sense of life, but none of them really fit. The God-shaped hole can only be filled by God made known through Jesus Christ. So let's go back to Paul's message to the Areopagus. Picking up at verse 26, here's the story that he tells them. He says, you've been looking for this unknown God. Well, let me tell you 
about this unknown God. He came in person. He says, from one ancestor, he made all nations to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps grope for him and find him, though indeed he is not far from each one of us. Again, I love Paul's approach here. Again, he's not berating the Athenians for their paganism, for their idolatry. He doesn't blast them. He says, I can see that you're searching. It's, you're groping around. That's the image he uses. But guess what? God's closer than you think. That should give us an encouragement. Because very often, I think, we assume in our culture, well, that person that I'm friends with, that family member, they've got no interest in God. But actually, I think they're groping. They're looking. And God is closer than you think. God can surprise us, actually, with just how close he is. And what I love about Paul's approach is he doesn't berate them. He affirms what he can, but he seeks to redirect that focus to the true story, to the true one. When I look back at the Jesus revolution of the 1960s and 70s and my own parents' faith, in many ways, they were young hippies looking for a story to make sense of their life. And, and they didn't look or sound like the kind of traditional Christian culture around them, but they found a story that made sense of their lives. They found a story that spoke to them. And today, I think it's the same. We shouldn't be berating and kind of getting involved in the culture wars. Actually, we're here to tell a better story. Like Paul, we need to recognize that the passion people have for whatever cause whatever particular, you know, progressive cause or, or right-wing cause or whatever it is, it's, it's actually a sign that they're searching, okay? Let's not write anyone off because they're all searching in their own way. And we're here to tell them that there's a true story, a good, true, and beautiful story that makes sense of this story that you're looking for. I believe we're actually living in a time when people are more open than they have been in a long time to the story of Christianity. It's because I think the stories people are telling themselves, these stories that ultimately won't satisfy them, that won't fill that God-shaped hole, they're kind of running out of steam. We see it in the culture wars. People are so burdened, so exhausted by the fact that all these stories are bumping up against each other that finally I think they're ready to look again at the original story. They're looking again at this funny old book, the Bible, and I'm gonna be talking tonight about some of the interesting secular thinkers pointing people back towards the Bible and asking, could the original story still have something to say to us? I think it does. I wanna talk about three ways in which if there is a groundswell of people looking for a story to make sense of their lives, how we could lean into that as a church and as individuals. Three ways that I want to share before I finish of how we could do that in our culture, in our time. The first way is I believe that if we're in the Areopagus, if you like, the Areopagus of our culture, there are three lessons we could learn from, from Paul and from the culture that has come before us, the Jesus Revolution, the ways in which we saw God move. Firstly, we want to make people want it to be true. Okay, what do I mean by this? Um, C.S. Lewis was an amazing Christian thinker. I'm sure many of you have read his books. Uh, he's one of my personal kind of intellectual heroes. He wrote amazing works of Christian apologetics. That simply means the, the rational defense of Christianity, books like Mere Christianity and The Problem of Pain and Miracles. And Lewis did an amazing job of showing the rational evidential case for faith. And that has really appealed to people like me and many people I know. I've kind of spent a lot of my adult working career engaging in this apologetics. But the books that C.S. Lewis is best known for aren't those books, are they? They're his Chronicles of Narnia. And the Chronicles of Narnia are all about the imagination. They're all about showing people an extraordinary world of talking beasts, of truth, valor, good, right and wrong, and the children who enter the world of Narnia, they're given this amazing quest to go on. And of course, there's a, a wise, just king, a lion, Aslan, who rules over it, but he's not a tame lion. And what I think Lewis did in painting this world, this fantasy world of Narnia, is he made people wish that there were a place like that. I mean, who hasn't knocked on the back of a wardrobe once or twice in their life just to see 
if there might be a magical world laying behind it. He made us wish that it were true, but then he did something important. He said, it is true. The thing I've made you wish were true, it is true. It exists in our world. Aslan just has a different name, Jesus Christ. And I think that's our job today. It's to start with people's imagination. It's really important sometimes to go to that intellectual place, but actually we start where people are. That's where Paul started with the Athenians. You know, he started where they were. He quoted to them their own poets and thinkers. He says, for we are his offspring, as some of your own poets have said, for in him we live and move and have our being. Scholars think that Paul is probably quoting two contemporary thinkers of that age. Epimen, I always get this wrong, Epimenides and Aratus. They were both pagan thinkers and poets. And the, the modern equivalent might be like in your conversation with someone when you're trying to talk to them about Jesus, you, you drop in a Jay-Z lyric or, or a Taylor Swift line or something like that. Th these were the, the people who were influential. And it's so interesting, isn't it, that Paul is absolutely willing to go to where they are in their culture, the things that are firing them, the music, the lyrics, the poetry, and say, hey, I can see what you're searching for here. Can I tell you a story that makes sense of that? And that's our job as well. Imaginatively, creatively, start where people are. That may not be the Bible. It may not be an intellectual argument for God. It might be simply asking them, what gets you out of bed in the morning? Okay, what's your reason for living? What do you enjoy? Is it art? Is it music? Is it sport? There's gonna be somewhere that you can begin a conversation with someone and realize actually, this person has a passion. This person has things they do believe in. And that might be the place to start to engage them with this idea that actually their passions, their dreams, their longings are ultimately found in a true and beautiful story. So the first thing I'd say is make them wish that it were true. Blaise Pascal, again, he said this. He said, make religion attractive. Make good people wish it were true and then show that it is. So how do we do that? We, we use art, we use music, we use literature. We use all the God-given creativity we have in this building and in the church to show people that there's a good, true, and beautiful story that they can find. The second way is that we need to keep Christianity weird. Now, I picked up this phrase when I was traveling in America, and I went to Oregon. I went to speak at a church in Portland, and I saw lots of stickers saying, keep Portland weird. And I've, I've bumped into it in other places, but I thought, you know what, this works for the Christian faith. We need to keep Christianity weird. What do I mean by that? Well, sometimes we're guilty of thinking, if only we looked just like the culture around us, if only we blended in so much and caused no offense to anyone, would people come through the doors and we'd see people coming to faith. It turns out that is not the way to evangelize a culture. Because if you look just like the culture, it turns out you become invisible. And, and, and people are like, well, why do I need to go there when I can find exactly the same thing down the road in the social club or at the sports hall or, or in, the, in the gig? I recently spoke actually to an agnostic journalist in the UK called Ben Sixsmith, and he wrote a fascinating article recently. And I'm just going to quote from it. He said this. He said, I am not religious, so it's not my place to dictate what Christians should and should not believe. Still, if someone has a faith worth following... I feel that their beliefs should make me feel uncomfortable for not doing so. If they share 90% of my lifestyle and values, then there's nothing especially inspiring about them. Instead of making me want to become more like them, it looks very much as if they want to become more like me. And I've met this again with lots of these secular thinkers I've been speaking to in recent years. Again, Tom Holland, the secular historian I referenced earlier, he's got a fascinating story. I'll share more of it this evening. But one of the things that he said to me, he said, look, Justin, when I do go to church, I go to the oldest church in London. He goes to a 900-year-old church called St. Bartholomew the Great. And why does he go there? It's because of the mystery, the ritual, the tradition, the sense of history. He loves the weirdness of it, he says. He wants something different to the everyday life. He wants a different story. He said this, he said, if the church wants to survive and thrive in the West, he says the churches need to absolutely embrace their beliefs rather than being slightly embarrassed about them. 
The churches have to lay claim to everything that is weirdest, most countercultural, most peculiar. Don't duck all the stuff about angels. Major on that. He's, he's, he's obsessed with angels, uh, Tom Holland. It, he's, but it's so interesting to hear a secular historian saying, keep Christianity weird. Don't kind of make it blend in so much that it becomes invisible. And I think that's really important. We want to be relevant to the culture. Of course we do. But we also need to shine as a light. The reason that Paul had a hearing in Athens was because people thought he was strange, peculiar. What is this guy going on about? Let's give him a hearing. Keep Christianity weird. If people are looking for a different kind of story, and that's what I would encourage you with, is it's okay to own the weirdness of your faith. Because sometimes that is the very thing that will attract people towards it. Third thing. Let's create a community that counters cancel culture. Sorry about the tongue twister there. I believe we're living in the midst of a meaning crisis in our culture. People looking for a story to make sense of their life. They've been looking in all kinds of places, but they're coming up empty. But there's one place, I think, where they can probably find a story that makes sense of their life, and it's right here in the church. And it's one of the few places where people can still find face-to-face -face human community. We live in an increasingly digital age, social media, smartphones, AI. It's possible now to live completely independently of almost ever having another human in front of you, another human relationship. The church is going to be, I think, increasingly in coming years, one of the few places where you can find true human community. Now, the thing about that is that it's messy. Okay, because when you get a whole bunch of people together, we're going to be very different. We're going to have all kinds of backgrounds, all kinds of different perspectives on life. The miracle of the church is that it brings you together around something that unifies you, Jesus Christ. And people can bring all their doubts. They can bring their messed up lives. They can bring their questions. And they can find actually there's a place of grace where you're not going to be excluded. You're not going to be canceled because actually... God got cancelled on the cross in our place. And that means we can do something completely different to the world. We need that more than ever. If we're going to tell a better story, a more creative story, a more imaginative story, if we're going to keep Christianity weird, we're going to do all of that in community. And this is the place where people will find that that story makes sense in their lives. Paul in Athens he was just at the beginning of the, uh, an extraordinary explosion that would take place of the Christian church across the Eastern world. He didn't see a lot of fruit that day after his talk on the Areopagus. A lot of people scoffed and said, what, what's he talking about? But a few people wanted to hear more. And it was the beginning of the church in that place. It's extraordinary what God can do. I think we can be really surprised at what God can do, even in what seems like the hardest, most countercultural places. Today, if you feel like, no, there's no chance, Justin, in Ventura in the 21st century, you look at my friends and my family, my work colleagues, they don't want to hear about this. I think God has something surprising for us because God is not as far away as you or they think. I want to end with, with a story that that just encapsulates this. It's a story of Paul Kingsnorth. Now, Paul Kingsnorth is from the UK. He's a celebrated, award-winning author and poet. And he's got a background in environmental activism. But what's fascinating about Paul Kingsnorth, when I sat down for a conversation with him, is he told me his life story. And he told me about how, as a, a young man, as a teenager, he completely rejected Christianity. He kind of, he had a nominal understanding of faith growing up in the UK in a church environment, church school, but he rejected it. He said, that, that's, just a, that's just a power play. That's just a story I'm not interested. It's irrelevant to my life. But as he continued trying to look for something to make sense of his life, he was really concerned about nature. He loved being out in the outdoors. He loved the mountains and the hills and the forests. And that's why he, he gave his life to environmental activism. But even that, he found, didn't sustain him. He found actually... As a movement, it was starting to be taken over by a certain ideology, and he found that that wasn't the thing that fired him. So he became a Buddhist. He said, maybe that's where I'll find my meaning, looking inside myself, finding a kind of internal peace. And for many years, he was a Buddhist. 
But even that he found ultimately didn't satisfy. Because as he was out in nature, he found that he wanted to worship something. He said, I couldn't just look inside. I had to look outside. There must be more. So he decided to worship nature. He became a Wiccan. He became a modern day um, priest or witch in the Wiccan religion. Pretty far out. But he was there for a few years, kind of doing nature worship in the woods. But he realized even that didn't make sense of his longing. He realized it was just a pastiche of kind of esoteric 60s teaching and some Christian heresies in the end, he said. <laughs> Finally, to his own great surprise, Paul Kingsnorth found himself captured by Christ. This is the way he put it to me. He said, I'd gone looking for Buddhism and I'd gone looking for Wicca because I thought they fitted with how I saw the world. I didn't think Christianity fitted how I saw the world and I didn't want to be a Christian. But I started having very strange experiences that are difficult to describe. I was having dreams about Jesus and I was meeting Christians every five minutes. He even told me that he sat down one night for dinner with his wife who wasn't a Christian and she said to him over dinner, you're going to become a Christian. And he said, what are you talking about? I'm not gonna become a Christian. And she said, you are. And he says she was right. Because Paul Kingsnell says he, he feels like he was dragged forcibly out of Wicca and towards Jesus. He started to look into it. He had all of these things happening around him. He started to look at this story again and he found suddenly there was a story here that made sense of his life, that made sense of all those longings, that searching, that wish for more. I tell his story in more detail in the book and on my podcast series, but what I want to say to you is if it can happen to Paul Kingsnorth, it could happen to anyone. People are looking for a story to make sense of their life. The question is, are we ready to tell that story again to our friends and families and neighbors? Sometimes we can feel a bit cynical, a bit jaded. We feel like, no, they're, they're, they'd never listen. I'm telling you, God is the God who is closer than you think. And he can be doing something in the life of someone that you've never realized could be possible. And through our lives and through our love and this glorious, messy thing we call the church, we can tell a good, true, and beautiful story that makes sense of all those other stories that people are looking for in their lives. I just want to encourage you this morning not to give up, to keep praying, to keep trusting, to keep holding people out in prayer. And you may not be someone who's there yourself, and that's absolutely fine. But I want you to know that there's a God who knows your story and wants to invite you into the greatest story of all. Shall we pray? Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the greatest storyteller ever. Paul in Athens told your story to the skeptics and the thinkers. The Jesus people found your story here on the West Coast 50 plus years ago. Today, people are looking for a story. Help us to tell that story. With creativity, with boldness, owning the weirdness of this story, but absolutely confident that you are the God who surprises us at every turn. Give us the faith to pray, to believe, to know that you're with us and that you're speaking in our culture today. Amen.